Hi, my name is Scott Carter. I'm a mental health therapist with the Fairfax County Juvenile Detention Center and Shelter Care 2 Mental Health Unit. Today we're going to be talking about suicide prevention in residential facilities. Suicide is not a topic that, generally speaking, everyone likes to talk about for understandable reasons. But it is an important part of everyone's training who works with this very unique population of juveniles. The first thing that we should do is define suicidal behavior. Everybody has a generally an intuitive understanding of what suicide is. But seldom do people take the time to assign a very specific definition to it. Suicidal behavior, for our purposes, is going to be defined as behaviors whose intensity and frequency exists along a continuum from thinking about ending one's life, to developing a plan, to non-fatal suicidal behavior, to ending one's life. Suicidal behavior differs from suicidal ideation. Suicidal ideation is usually the precursor to behavior. Suicidal ideation defined specifically are thoughts of harming or killing oneself. The severity of suicidal ideation is assessed by determining the frequency, intensity, and duration of these thoughts. When a mental health professional is attempting to determine whether or not somebody presents as a mild, moderate, or significant potential threat to themselves and others due to suicidal ideation. Specifically, these are many of the uh, factors that we take into consideration. Suicide is defined as a fatal, self-destructive act committed with explicit or inferred intention of ending one's own life. The reason why we have to differentiate between explicit and inferred intention is because of the following. There are times when individuals end one, their own life with a very, very purposeful action with full intention of killing themselves. In these cases, it can be very difficult to intervene or prevent suicide. However, there's also a certain subset of the population who are going to attempt suicide who make an attempted suicide that is non-lethal or a little bit less lethal perhaps than they intended. An example of this could be perhaps of a person who takes five Tylenol pills. Certainly it's a gesture of self-harm, certainly it's a means by which people do kill themselves, which is overdose, but generally speaking five pills will not likely lead in death. However, it should still be considered a suicide intent, a suicide attempt, perhaps with inferred intention of dying. Even amongst youth who are not involved with the court system, or furthermore involved with the court system's residential facilities, suicide is a significant problem for young adults and adolescents. According to the CDC, Suicide is the, leading, the third leading cause of death for youth between the ages of 10 and 24. Each year, approximately 149,000 youth between the ages of 10 and 24 receive medical care for self-inflicted injuries in emergency departments across the U.S. In 2007, 14.5% of high school students reported that they had seriously considered attempting suicide during the past year. 11% reported having a plan. 6.9% reported actually attempting. Again, these statistics reflect risk amongst youth in the general population, the population that is not involved with the court system, or furthermore, not involved with residential facilities. The research that we have about youth who are involved with the court system suggests that this risk for suicide can be substantially greater. Hi. During the last section, we were talking about juvenile suicide in the general population, and we began talking about how suicide risk can be substantially greater for the kids who are involved with the court system, and furthermore, who are involved with the court system's various residential facilities. From 1995 to 1999, 110 juvenile suicides were reported in detention centers. Among these juveniles who committed suicide, 
70% were confined for non-violent crimes. 66% had a history of mental illness. 54% were taking psychotropic medication at the time of their suicide. More than two-thirds had a history of suicidal behavior. I think that it's also important to bear in mind that these statistics, specifically the statistics that are referring to a previous history of mental illness and also a history of taking psychotropic medication, reflect a certain segment of the population who had already had contact with mental health professionals, who had had a documented, diagnosed mental illness, and does not take into account the subset of the population who was mentally ill but has not ever had any kind of services. For many of us who have never considered suicide as an option uh, for coping with crisis in our lives, it can seem rather mysterious. Certainly very, very tragic, the idea that somebody so young would want to end their life when it would seem that at the beginning of their life there was really nothing but potential. However, it should be understood that suicide is at its root a coping strategy. Many of the children with whom we work experience very, very difficult day-to-day -day lives due to external factors such as difficult parenting situations, difficult school situations, difficult peer situations, and internal factors as well such as mental illness and substance abuse and addiction. Whatever the cause, Suicide can be understood as a coping mechanism. For example, a person considering, considering suicide may want to end emotional pain, which certainly can be very difficult to handle if someone has never been taught or shown the appropriate coping skills. They may be unsure how to change their circumstances. They may be unsure if their circumstances will indeed change, no matter what they do. They have difficulty believing that things will ever improve. Finally, they may not know another way of outwardly expressing their painful inner state. Whatever the root cause, understanding suicide helps put the behavior into context and can lead to the identification of alternative coping strategies that do not result in self-harm. And I think that that is the important thing to bear in mind. That at the end of the day, as mental health professionals, as child care workers, as specialists who work with this subset of the population, essentially what we're trying to do is to give them an alternative coping skill, or a, a set of alternative coping skills that they can resort to before they decide to try to attempt suicide. It's not realistic to think that we can always identify the individuals who are at risk for suicide. There may indeed be some time when an individual has absolutely no history of any sort of risk factors, has never voiced interest in trying to end their life, may indeed try to kill themselves. However, those instances tend to be very few and very far between. By and large, there are certain risk factors that we as professionals can look for that might help us understand who is at greater risk and who might be at lesser risk. Of course, the best predictor of what somebody's future behavior might be is the behavior that they've engaged in in the past. If somebody has engaged in suicidal behavior on a previous occasion, or if they've engaged in any sort of self-injurious behavior, this might suggest that they could become a significant threat to themselves in a future date. If an individual has a history of mental illness, this could be a risk factor to take into consideration when determining whether or not somebody would be at risk in the future for engaging in suicidal behavior. If a person has a history of alcohol or drug abuse, this could place them at risk for suicidal behavior. Indeed, most of the kids that we work with have a history of alcohol or drug abuse, but bear in mind that when they come to a residential facility, if they have been using drugs 
or alcohol to cope with a very painful emotional inner state. They have been deprived of this coping skill, being alcohol and drugs. And in the absence of their primary coping skill, they may be at a loss for what else to do. At that point, they might consider engaging in suicidal behavior. If a child has a history of fa a family history of mental illness, or more importantly, a history of suicide or violence, this could place them at greater risk for engaging in suicidal behavior in the future as well. This is primarily due to a few reasons. The first one being that people tend to learn behaviors by observation. If they've observed a parent or significant caregiver engaging in self-harm, they could indeed be more likely to engage in that behavior because they have learned that it might be a viable option as a coping strategy. Additionally, if they've been victims or witnesses of domestic violence, they may indeed be more likely to engage in suicide, as suicide is at its heart a violent act committed against the self. Physical illness can also place an individual at risk for suicide. Certain physical illnesses, whose cures are not readily available, can make someone feel perhaps hopeless, that their future will not be any brighter no matter how they, no matter how they uh, try. Those situations also can result in a greater risk for considering suicide. When a child feels alone, feeling that they don't matter, certainly then they could consider suicide as an option. If a child is detained or placed in a residential facility for the first time, this could place them at greater risk. The experience of being detained or the experience of being placed in a residential facility can be very traumatic, especially for our subset of, uh, uh, sub, uh, population of kids who, as we know from the literature that's been uh, generated within the past few years, is highly traumatized by and large. So in many ways, simply coming to detention or coming to a residential facility can be re-traumatizing. Many of the kids that we work with, tragically, have had to take care of themselves or their siblings or even their parents for an extended period of time. This has placed an inordinate amount of responsibility upon their shoulders that they were not capable of, of handling at the time but in addition, has resulted in them having a significant amount of power over their own freedom, and indeed the freedom of those around them. Experiencing a loss of power can be a significant blow to the ego, and can also result in someone not wanting to uh, consider going on. It may be unbearable, the thought of having to give up their power to, a different, uh, to another authority figure. We're continuing to discuss risk factors that residential counselors should look for when, help, when trying to determine which residents might present a greater risk for suicide than others. Another factor that, that can be uh, identified perhaps by residential counselors includes believing that things will never get better. The feeling that someone is trapped can lead somebody to engage in thoughts and behaviors that otherwise they would not engage in. They might try to engage in a, in a behavior like suicide in a desperate attempt to end their painful inner emotional state. And finally, the belief that things in, situ in any given situation are either all good or all bad. Such a line of thinking can result in believing that there is no gray area and perhaps that if, unless things are all good, they're only bad, and therefore might be bad enough to consider attempting suicide. It's important to remember that although we work together as a team towards the same goal, which is the safety and well-being of the residents, our jobs are distinct. As direct care staff, you are not responsible for assessing an individual's level of potential threat to themselves and or others due to mental illness. However, your training, experience, and intuition are important factors to help determine who may be in need of service from a mental health professional. 
I think that this principle is especially important to remember. Simply because one does not have a graduate degree or a doctorate or a significant amount of experience diagnosing and treating mental illness, it does not mean that you are not experts in human behavior. Indeed, with your level of skill, many of you are very familiar with how the population that we both work with will react to the, uh, to the unique environments that we work in. This intuition and this expertise is invaluable to me mental health professionals and to the kids that we work with in trying to ins ensure that the kids that we work with remain safe. Here's an acronym that can be used by residential staff and mental health professionals alike to remember the factors that place the residents at times at increased risk for suicide. Is PATH warm? The first question is the obvious question, ideation. Are they thinking about suicide? S, do they have a history of substance abuse? P, do they have a sense of purposelessness? that they don't matter. A, anxiety. When people are anxious, when their stress, stress levels are up, they're more likely to engage in behaviors that are poorly thought out and indeed are not part of the regular spectrum of behavioral action. T, do they feel trapped? Do they feel that there's no way out? Are they willing to consider a desperate option to remove themselves from a very painful and unfamiliar situation? H, hopelessness. Do they believe that nothing will ever get better? Again, do they believe that they don't matter? Such a feeling state certainly can put them at a greater risk. Withdrawal, W. Do they seem to withdraw into themselves? Have they stopped interacting with people in a manner in which they did before? Perhaps has their emotional state changed significantly? such that something just doesn't seem quite right about them. A, anger. Certainly many of the kids that we work with have difficulty regulating anger and aggression. Certainly the presence of anger is not necessarily something that we would consider unusual. However, if one of the kids that we're working with seems inordinately angry, perhaps more angry than they are usually, unreasonably angry, or frankly, angry for no apparent reason at all, this could be a potential risk factor for an increase in the suicide or self-harm ideation in general. R, recklessness. Are they engaging in very impulsive behaviors? Behaviors that seem to uh, disregard their own personal safety? Certainly, this sort of behavioral situation can put someone at its increased risk for self-harm. Finally, M, mood change. Does this person simply just not seem right? Do they seem different somehow than they usually are? Are they happier than they usually are? Are they more depressed than they usually are? Are they angrier? It's important to note that a trend that has been observed has been that persons who are previously very depressed and sad and are considering suicide ideation or suicide as a uh, potential coping strategy when they finally made the decision to end their life, they can experience a sudden sense of euphoria, the sense that it's all going to get better, that the burden is about to lift. And when this happens, mood can substantially increase. This should be regarded as a potential risk factor. And when this happens, mental health staff probably should be consulted. Sometimes warning signs are less subtle. In these cases, our decision-making process is generally a little bit easier. When warning signs indicate immediate or acute risk, these signs can include threatening to hurt or kill oneself, looking for ways to kill him or herself, talking about or writing about suicide. Predictably, an individual who is talking about suicide, talking about self-harm, talking about death, could potentially be considering ending their life. 
whenever this occurs in a residential facility, it should be taken very seriously and appropriate mental health staff should be notified immediately. Your particular residential facility will likely have its own policy for dealing with individuals who become suicidal or who voice uh, ideation or intention of engaging in self-harm. However, a few general principles probably apply to every facility within the JDRC. First, if at any time you become concerned, become concerned about the potential safety of one of your residents, you should take necessary precautions within the guidelines of your program to decrease the opportunity for that resident to harm him or herself. These precautions certainly can vary from facility to facility. The juvenile detention, for example, de detention center, for example, will take precautions that can be vastly different from the precautions that foundations or shelter care to or boys probation house are willing to take. Your supervisor should be not notified immediately. Even if mental health staff are present in your facility, remember the supervisor is in charge of the facility and is responsible for ensuring the well-being of the residents and the employees. They should be notified ASAP. Finally, consult with available mental health professionals to create a plan for safely helping the resident complete his or her stay at the less secure shelter, shelter care two, juvenile detention center, foundations, boys probation house. The key here is working with the mental health professional. Certainly we're not going to be experts in the unique needs of your particular program all the time. In those occasions, it will be important that collaboration take place so we can maximize the chances for creating a safe environment for this particular resident. Hi, we were previously discussing how to proceed when concerns arise about the potential safety of a resident in a facility of the JDRC due to suicide. In our next section, we're going to discuss what to do when you become about concerned about the immediate safety of a resident in a residential